I was born in Lowell, Massachusetts, and right after my birth, uh, I was born in 1943 in the middle of World War II. Uh, we moved to Quebec uh, to a small uh, village called Trois Rivières, and my parents were both French Canadian, and my father was working in the Navy at the time in naval intelligence. And so he would interview the uh, sailors coming off of the Canadian boats to see if they had seen U-boats when they were out and uh, collect uh, intelligence and then send it back to Washington. So the first three to four years I lived in Quebec. I only spoke French. I couldn't speak English when I moved back to Lowell. But that wasn't a very big problem because in Lowell there was a very big French-Canadian community working in the mills. Uh, there was a French newspaper called L'Etoile. There was a uh, French school. I went to Notre Dame de Lourdes, where people spoke both English and French. Uh, but my parents really uh, emphasized the, the critical importance of being able to communicate in English in an English-speaking country. It wasn't that they wanted me to lose the French, but they wanted me to know how to communicate well in English. And so uh, they really uh, emphasized that a great deal. We moved to an English-speaking neighborhood, and uh, one of the... Uh, Interesting experiences that I had uh, moving into that English-speaking neighborhood is I learned that great American game called baseball. And I was about five or six years old, and I got up to bat, and I hit the ball, and I knew to run to first base, but I didn't know much more than that. And the uh, kid behind me got up. He got a hit. Uh, he starts running right at me because he hit the ball a long way. I had no idea what to do, and everybody on the field started screaming run home run home and the way they were screaming i thought my mother died so i ran all the way home i had no idea it meant running to home plate <laughs> okay because my english was not that good i had a hard time even saying their names in, in english so um that was uh you know part of my growing up was the experience of being bilingual and uh, struggling with uh, uh learning to be a, a good english speaker and uh, uh, be successful academically uh, in school. I was very fortunate. I had the opportunity to come to Worcester uh, to go to Assumption Prep, uh, which, uh, which was uh, when I was 14 years old. And I lived at the prep school. Uh, people in Worcester would be familiar with the prep school, but it is no longer in existence. It's now Quintigamon Community College. Uh, Assumption Prep is uh, known throughout the country because of the 1953 tornado that came through Worcester. Uh, and the prep school was right in the middle of that tornado and it took the whole top of the school off. It's just fortunate that everybody had gone home uh, just three days before the tornado came through. But 11 priests, Assumptionists, brothers and priests, uh, perished in that, uh, I think it was 11, perished in that, that, that tornado. Uh, so that was a very big uh, event. Coming here to the prep school was a big event for me. It was really an opportunity that uh, probably changed the whole direction of my life. Um, and the uh, folks at the uh, prep school uh, certainly uh, created uh, opportunities for me to grow as a person and, um, and it just made a huge difference. Um, so I spent four years there, and then I went to uh, Assumption College. I am the only person uh, to date who graduated from the prep school, graduated from the college with a BA, graduated from the college with a master's degree, and two years ago, the college gave me an honorary doctorate degree. So I have four degrees from Assumption, and since Assumption Prep does not exist anymore, no one else is ever gonna be able to do that again. <laughs> so uh, I am an Assumption guy, I guess, uh, through and through. When I was in high school, uh, I volunteered uh, to uh, work with kids out at Nazareth Home for Boys in Leicester here. And it was my first experience at working with uh, kids who have been abused and neglected. And we would go, a group of us, uh, about eight to 12 of us, that would go out to the Nazareth School and we would work one-to-one -one on the weekends with, uh, with the kids out at, uh, out at the school. They were all there because of abuse and neglect and special needs that they had. And I always uh, was so impressed that when you would go there, the kids would all come running up to you, you know, pick me, pick me, because they're very needy, um, looking for that kind of uh, individual attention and support. And that kind of got me down the path of wanting to help kids who, whose life experiences have been difficult, because even my own life experiences, I navigated through 
becoming assimilated uh, and navigated through some very uh, challenging times within my own family, I knew how important uh, it was to have mentors, because that's really what the prep school provided for me, some excellent mentors. Um, and so I did that through high school. We, we even had an opportunity uh, to go uh, in my, uh, I think it was my junior year, we went to New York City where the assumption is to have a parish. And uh, we lived with a poor family in the uh, neighborhood of the parish. And we visited the drug addiction island out in uh, the East River. And it was uh, a very eye-opening experience to see people struggling through uh, you know, detoxification from drugs and all of that. But it, again, it was just another uh, experience that uh, made me feel like there are opportunities to make other people's lives better, and so I, I began to cultivate that interest. When I went to Assumption College, uh, I fairly quickly became a volunteer and a volunteer staff person at the Lincoln Square Boys Club in Worcester and became very involved in running groups for the uh, boys club. I would take groups up to Assumption to the basketball games and other activities that were open to the community and, and so forth. Uh, and so again, I continued my interest in um, providing opportunities for kids to see what college is like, uh, to see that there's a, a brighter future out there. Uh, and the wonderful thing about America is if you are willing to work, uh, there is nothing that is not possible. Everything is possible. Uh, and so uh, that's the great dream, is the possibility is there if you're willing to seize it and work for it. So when I graduated from the college, I went on uh, to uh, work with the Division of Child Guardianship, which today is called the Division of Children and Family Services with abused and neglected kids who came from homes where there was serious abuse, and I've seen some horrendous uh, uh, abuse of children during that career. And uh, I worked there for four years. And while I was there, I had the opportunity to go away to get my graduate degree in uh, psychiatric social work. And when I came back, uh, the position of being executive director of this very small new organization that was really created out of the Lyndon Johnson era uh, of uh, crime in a free society report which suggested that we could do a better job with uh, juvenile delinquents. From that came some federal money uh, and in Worcester we had just created the Worcester Juvenile Court. The court uh, had the support of this group of volunteers that incorporated into a nonprofit called Youth Opportunities Upheld, became known as UWINK, and the first employee they hired was myself back then and we started a program called Intensive Juvenile Probation. When, when was that? That was in 1971. So in 1971, so I started my career with the Division of Child Guardianship in 1966. And then I started with UINC in 1971. And it was me and a secretary at the time and we, uh, we uh, created a program called Intensive Juvenile Probation. We did a lot of research, we had control groups, uh, and we were able to demonstrate statistically, that we could take the toughest kids from the juvenile court and provide them with an intensive experience every day of the week they came after school. We would see their families in their home in the evenings on weekends to do family therapy. Um, we uh, really were there for them 24 hours a day, uh, but they came in a structured program, you know, in the afternoons after school. And uh, the, the program actually was, as I said, very successful. The recidivism rates were much lower than regular probation. We published several articles, actually in a couple of languages, on the program. So uh, that success led to the state coming to us and saying, well, could you run a foster care program for us? And that led to, can you run a shelter for us? And that led to, can you run a mental health clinic for us? And so the agency began to grow to meet changing needs over time. Uh, and I retired uh, two years ago from uh, UINC after 41 years. And so I started with one building, one program, myself and a secretary, 41 years prior to that. And when I left, there were 32 different sites, 63 programs, and 700 employees providing uh, 
residential services, everything from an inpatient psychiatric level, uh, hospital level care, to group homes, to uh, foster care, and so forth. We had about 150 children living in one of our services when I left on any given day. We had educational programs that were special educational uh, day schools, residential schools. We also did Upward Bound. And we had uh, almost 300 kids in one of our educational programs on any given day. <coughs> We ran mental health clinics in Southbridge, Gardner, and Worcester, and we were doing about 1,600 patient visits a week um, in our mental health clinics. And then we ran community-based services, which this uh, office is part of the community-based um, system of, of UA. So uh, it, it grew to meet a wide range of uh, problems that have emerged with kids over the years with uh, changing uh, revenue. People always ask, well, how did you fund it? Of course, we were very lucky to have a lot of private donors that supported the mission. We had a lot of success, uh, uh, and so we had a lot of people who were willing to talk about that success. But um, uh, over the last 20 years, most of the revenue has come from insurance. Most of the clients we see are through the behavioral health, the health <coughs> Uh, which is uh, the, the clinics and the inpatient uh, hospitalization. So our medical staff grew uh, exponentially over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Well, I think that uh, right now the demand for service exceeds our ability to meet the demand, um, but the ability to reimburse uh, things is, is still a challenge, particularly in child psychiatry. Finding and retaining child psychiatrists in the community is probably the biggest challenge that we face. Um, and I, I, would, I would say that the biggest community problem that we face, without question, is substance abuse, whether it's alcohol abuse, drug abuse. Uh, I would uh, say that more than 90% of the kids who are abused physically, mentally, sexually, uh, there's some substance abuse in that process. So. Uh, that dilemma is a societal dilemma that we need to work on. And I know we can work on it, we can be successful. And just to uh, demonstrate that, we have cut back the number of people who smoke to uh, you know, a very small percentage uh, compared to what it was because we did such a national campaign to change the values around smoking as a health hazard. We could do the same thing with drinking and uh, the use of drugs, I think, would have an equally uh, important impact on that problem as well. So I think the future for you, Inc., in terms of the amount of business that's out there is very bright. Uh, I think the uh, challenge will be able to meet the demand and to do it in a way that is financially uh, sound and uh, adequately supports the personnel that do the work. So I, I think those will be the challenges. Uh, that uh, people will be facing as, as they go forward. So I moved to Shrewsbury, actually, um, I, 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 it's got to be over 40 years, for sure. Uh, and uh, I moved into the house that we're in now uh, 39 years ago because my youngest daughter is 38. She was born in that house. Uh, I live right in the center of Shrewsbury on Main Street. Uh, and I've lived there, like I said, for almost 40 years in that same place. The uh, town of Shrewsbury, for us, as we looked around where we wanted to raise our family, provided uh, a wonderful educational opportunity. The schools in Shrewsbury are really outstanding. In fact, I was just reading that the uh, school department uh, was rated in the top 2% in terms of academic outcome, graduation rates, and those kinds of things. Uh, and it's just constantly rated highly. They were also rated in the top 5%, I think it was, in terms of per pupil cost. So our costs are low and our outcomes are terrific. Uh, so that kind of school system is the kind of school system you want to raise your children in. And uh, most of my children went to the Beale School in the center of town. Sue Ketchadurian uh, was a wonderful principal, had a terrific staff, and I hope if any of them hear this, they should all feel uh, very proud that they uh, uh, did such a fabulous job educating uh, all of our children. I've been very blessed. I have, uh, they're all grown up now. Two of them are lawyers. One of them's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, the fourth one is a um, uh, 
uh, school adjustment complex. So they've all been very successful in life, and that foundation came from the Shrewsbury Public Schools. So I, I think that's a, a, a real draw. And I think today it's a real draw for people to come to the town of Shrewsbury, and the town of Shrewsbury continues to grow. Um, and I've uh, had the privilege of being an elected town meeting member now for longer than I can remember. I'm sure it's well over 20 years, probably 30 years that I've been a town meeting member. And uh, I am very committed to um, uh, being a participant. One of my favorite sayings is the world is governed by those who show up, right? You have to show up if you want to change the world and make it a better place. Uh, one of the things that uh, 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 did happen, uh, it's got to be now almost 25, 30 years ago, uh, Dick Carney, who was the town manager at the time, had called me into his office because the judge in Westboro, who happened to be a good friend of mine, Judge Bruin, had identified that Shrewsbury uh, juveniles were uh, appearing before in higher numbers than Westboro or Northboro uh, juveniles. And he suspected it was because Shrewsbury didn't have any services for some of the kids who needed extra help. Uh, Northboro had Northboro Family Services and Westboro had Westboro Youth and Family Services that the town ought to look at it. And the manager asked me to head up a task force to take a look at this problem and make some recommendations. And uh, we pulled together a wonderful group of people that worked on that project. We did see the numbers were there showing that we needed to do better. And as a result of that, we went to the town with a recommendation with the manager's support to create Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services. And uh, Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services was created. I was the first president for the first couple of years. And today, Shrewsbury Youth and uh, Family Services is doing an absolutely terrific job serving um, a whole wide range of uh, folks in town dealing with issues from domestic abuse to academic struggling to fuel assistance. Uh, Shrewsbury Youth and Family Service doing a, a really terrific job. So it, it's one of the uh, contributions that I feel that I participated in, at least with a, a group of folks that um, really care deeply about the town. And I, I will say that's what makes Shrewsbury kind of special. People are invested in the town, the quality of life in the town, and no matter what side of the issue you're on, I happen to be a very big fan of the uh, public library. I think it's a cornerstone to democracy. And I, I know that some people feel that uh, the Internet's going to replace the library. It's not going to happen. The a library is going to use the Internet to help some of us access things that we might not otherwise uh, access so easily. I know uh, I use it to uh, get books on tape because I travel to the Cape and back. And I can keep up with my reading by listening to it in the car, so um, that's, a, that's a fun thing in addition to other things. I'm going to be going uh, to a computer class uh, at uh, the Shrewsbury Public Library, but there were two sides to the library question. People, uh, some folks did not feel that we uh, should spend the amount of money, uh, taxpayer money on the new library, and some people obviously felt that we should. Um, and so uh, whether you're on either side of that question, People worked hard to understand the issues, to make the case on both sides of that question, and people are dedicated to working to try to make the town a better place. Dialogue around issues is very important. It's part of what made democracy successful. But what makes it successful is when we can have a disagreement with respect and be able to walk away respecting each other, but recognizing that we don't necessarily agree on the issues. And we have lost a lot of that in this country in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, civil discourse has become very uh, cantankerous and uh, angry and unhappy, and it's unfortunate that we can't have a, a, a dialogue. Uh, on the other hand, I would say that we have been very blessed in Shrewsbury to have candidates running for public office, whether it be the selectmen, the school committee, uh, or the uh, representative and senators, uh, that we have people who are of real talent, willing to put themselves out there uh, to run for public office, and uh, we're, we're lucky to have such uh, talented people, because they're the policy makers, they're the ones that are working on our behalf, but um, I think it's uh, really great. The town meeting, of course, is just a, a, a great um, symbol of true democracy.
where the average person in the community can have a say in, in government. And, and it is unique to America that that happens where uh, people can uh, come, anybody can come to a town meeting and, and raise a question or raise an issue. The voter turnout is a huge problem in this country. It, it just, uh, you know, I, I don't, if, if I had a, a, an answer to that, I'd be, I'd probably be rich because I'd be out there uh, promoting it and all the elected officials would want to have me on as their campaign uh, managers. You know, I, I, I just, it's very difficult to understand. Uh, the, um, when you look at the voting pattern, you know, the elderly vote in large, large numbers and young people uh, so busy with their lives, they're not voting in the kind of numbers they should be voting in. It is a hugely important civic responsibility. Many elections now are being won by two, three, four votes. Even big votes on big money items at town meeting where two-thirds of the town are required sometimes are turned down by two votes, three votes. People don't realize how important their individual vote matters. It matters. Uh, and I think the apathy comes from the fact that people feel, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I, my one vote won't matter. It does matter. Uh, and again, um, for me, everybody's got to realize that um, the world isn't governed by those who show up. And if you show up and vote, then, you know, it's, the election's going to reflect all the people who voted. And, and, and in that sense, we become more of an oligarchy than a democracy. When you're down at 18% of the population of the country voting in a presidential campaign, that's not a democracy, that's an oligarchy. That means a small number of people are making the big decisions. And so uh, to turn that around is a challenge, and I, I don't have a, a real solution for it, but uh, and maybe, again, it's information getting people um, engaged in the process, and uh, I think education could play a role to help, but it's, it's a challenge. I, I don't really have uh, any specific kind of, uh, you know, recommendations for how the town might move forward. Uh, I, I do think that um, we need to continue to invest in our schools. Uh, I, I'm very concerned. While we have the very low per pupil costs and very high results, we have just gone through a period where we were starting to lose ground because the voters were not willing to spend the extra money. Um, so that if I have a big concern, it would be this, that we need to run the town and the country based on the common good of everyone, not on just my individual common good, okay? I am willing to pay taxes to make sure that kids get a good education. And if it means I have to pay more and go with a little bit less, I think it's an important investment to make. Now, uh, I know that uh, everybody's circumstances are different uh, and people have different kind of challenges, but the government for me represents the common good. And for me, Hubert Humphrey was right when he said, uh, the true moral test of a good government is how we take care of those in the dawn of life, our children, how we take care of those in the twilight of life, our elderly, and how we take care of those in the shadows of life, our disabled, disenfranchised folks. That's our moral responsibility. If we've been blessed, as I know I have been blessed over and over again, we have a moral responsibility to give back. Uh, to give back financially, to give back with our time, to give back with our talent. Uh, it's just uh, something I think that uh, each of us needs to do. And the more we go into, you know, what's in it for me, the more self-centered we become as a society, uh, I think the less, uh, less beneficial it's going to be for everybody. So that's my... So I think the town needs to just keep focused on the common good, keep education right up in the forefront. I think that's our biggest uh, challenge in Shrewsbury. Um, 